Okay, welcome, Luke Harding. Uh, you are a journalist, writer, and work for the Guardian newspaper in London. Ja tervetuloa munkin puolesta maan Ida Simes on voiman toimittaja. Ja tämä lava on kultti lava, joka on siis kulttuuri ja mielipidelehtien tämmöinen yhteinen lava. Ja nyt keskustellaan Ukrainasta, sodasta ja ennen kaikkea Venäjästä. I think we will, well, of course we will talk about Ukraine, but we will talk a lot about Russia. So, first look, uh, you have written a number of books, and the first one which was translated into Finnish was Mafia State, which was about you having to leave Russia. And uh, you have seen many changes in Russia, even though you have been outside for quite a while. Anyway, um, before we go to the war issue, what has happened in Russia during the recent years? Yeah, um, hello, good, good to see you. Um, I think what, when I was in Russia, I was there from 2007 and 2011. And back then it was a, a pretty dark place. It was a, a, an authoritarian country where Vladimir Putin was slowly but surely uh, getting rid of opposition, you, you, you might say, whether it's in politics or independent journalists who are dying in mysterious circumstances um, or civic society. Um, and what, what we saw was a kind of return to KGB methods of control uh, and intimidation. And, and you mentioned Mafia State. I mean, I, I write about that. We had a series of mysterious break-ins at our apartment by, by the KGB, the FSB. Um, I had strange um, young men wearing black leather jackets who would follow me around the icy streets of Moscow. Um, and, and some of it was funny and some of it was not funny. But, but really what's happened since then I mean, I, I was kicked out in 2011, is that, that Russia has got even darker, and I would say it's now a totalitarian state, actually a fascist state in, in some respects, where any kind of opposition to the regime is, is a crime. You, if you stand in Red Square and you hold a blank piece of paper, five seconds later you're arrested. If you tweet criticism of the war, you get seven years in jail. And all of the Russian uh, journalists, real journalists, independent journalists I used to work with, that they're either dead or they're in prison or they're in exile. Most are in exile. Let's, let's talk about dead people a little bit. Uh, but I explained this also in, in Finnish because I go forward. Eli Luke Harding on The Guardianin toimittaja, joka aikoinaan siis häädettiin Venäjältä, eli hänen työviisumia ei uusittu ja hän joutui lähtemään maasta. Hän on ensimmäinen toimittaja, siis joka on 2000-luvulla, niin kuin sanotaan, kirjoittanut itsensä ulos. Mutta mennään eteenpäin. Puhutaan vähän kuolleista ihmisistä ennen kuin päästään vieläkään tähän viimeiseen hyökkäyssotaan. Uh, in, uh, actually, yesterday I was on, uh, on uh, stage uh, talking about Anna Politkovskaya because her daughter has written a book. And um, before we get to this invasion, um, you also wrote about uh, the uh, agent Alexander Litvinenko. And Alexander Litvinenko was poisoned by polonium in London uh, three weeks after Anna Politkovska was murdered in uh, Moscow. But actually, Litvinenko didn't die immediately. He lived like three weeks or something before he actually died. And like you write in this book, he helped to solve his own murder. Um, they are all, all these things are sort of connected, aren't they? I mean, uh, the lack of uh, the totalitarian state, the lack of democracy and all the threats Kremlin is doing. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I mean, it all, all flows from the way that Vladimir Putin sees the world. I, I mean, it's classic KGB thinking. It's paranoia. He, he thinks that um, the West 
uh, the, the European Union, you know, Finland, uh, un, which is now, I, I, I'm pleased to learn, an unfriendly country, apparently you're officially unfriendly. Uh, um, the UK, the US, um, he, he, he genuinely believes that these countries are plotting to destroy um, and encircle Russia. And you could dismiss this as ridiculous or fantasy, apart from the fact that this becomes a psychological reality for millions of Russians because it's what they see on TV, it's what they hear on radio, it's what they see in films and in books, um, and, and, and so on. So there's a, been a huge effort to create a sort of parallel reality where Russia is the eternal victim, never the aggressor, always reacting to events. Um, and at the same time, Putin thinks that um, Russians who oppose his regime inside Russia are traitors who are working for the CIA, for the British, for Finnish intelligence services, it, whatever, it doesn't matter. And, and the, the rule for traitors is, is very unforgiving in KGB culture, that traitors have to be exterminated. And, and what we've seen over the past 15, 20 years is that, it sounds crazy, but it's true that Russia has had death squads of secret agents, some inside Russia, some outside Russia, who have been killing critics, uh, dissidents. I mean, you mentioned Alexander Litvinenko, but, but actually th this, book, Shadow State, this book, Shadow State, begins with an attempt to uh, murder Sergei Skripal, who is a Russian military intelligence guy. And you'll, you'll rem I don't know if anyone remembers the two killers who were sent to, to, to murder him, and they put Novichok poison on his door handle and he survived and afterwards they went on Russian television and they said that they were tourists who fell in love with the cathedral <clears throat> the beautiful cathedral and it's this mixture of menace and comedy that we see all the time in, in Russian operations. But, but it was a heartbreaking incident because also a totally innocent sort of bystander passerby was was killed uh, there is a tv series uh, is uh, do you have something to do uh, with that uh, no, uh, no, it, no. I, I mean two, two yeah. of my books have been made into hollywood movies um uh th this book th there were two tv series and as sometimes happens the other guys got you know they, they made the series and we didn't make the series um but but what i can say is i'm very close friends with marina Levinenko. The, the widow, and um, my, my book, A Very Expensive Poison, was turned into a play with, um, written by uh, Lucy, Lucy Preble, who's a famous English dramatist who wrote the script for Succession, the TV series. Uh, it was a big, big um, hit in London, and I'm told a, a Very Expensive Poison has also been on stage in Finland. Not in Helsinki, but somewhere else. Oh yeah, I, I mentioned this in Finnish. Eli very expensive poison on siis, siis tämä kirja uh, vaiennettu suomeksi. Me puhutaan Luke Hardingin kanssa nyt monesta kirjasta. Hän on kirjoittanut monta ja hän on ollut toki täällä messuillakin monta kertaa, mutta päästään nyt jo vihdoin siihen hyökkäykseen. Eli let's, let's go to invasion now. Um, Nothing starts when we think it starts. <laughs> so actually, Russia started invading Ukraine uh, years ago after the Euromaidan uh, demonstrations in, in Kiev. They got really angry. Then they uh, took Crimea and also uh, started to invade the eastern parts of Ukraine. Invasion that happened on the 24th of February, uh, that's... Uh, well, how to say, it's like a top of the iceberg, which is still going on, or yeah. how would you describe that? Well, well I, just, I just came back from Ukraine. I, I was in Kiev uh, last week. I, I was on the front line uh, in the east, in, in Donbass, as you say, the area which Russia kind of annexed. I, I was in Zap Zaporizhia on, on the southern front line, which is where Ukraine is trying to go forward through, through minefields, through trench defenses, and so on. But if you, if you talk to Ukrainians, <clears throat> what, what's, it, what's really interesting is that they, they say that this kind of Russian colonialism, that they see it as colonialism, began not, not in uh, 2022 or 2014, but began hundreds of years ago, actually. <clears throat> and, you know, what, what, one thing, you know, we're, we're at a book fair. Do you, can you guess 
when when the first uh, what the year was when Russia first banned Ukrainian books in the in the Ukrainian language. I, I give you 50 years either way. Oh, uh, <laughs> well, uh, uh, Catherine the Great took Crimea. 1780s. 1780s, yeah. yeah. Well, so, well, okay, I'll tell, well before so, that, it was 1622. Oh! So, it, so, so it, as Ukrainians tell it, they've had 400 years of Russian chauvinism, Russian oppression, Russian imperialism, an attempt not only to deny that Ukraine is a country, but also to, to cancel its language. I mean, for much of the 19th century, you could not perform a play in Ukrainian. Uh, you could not... I have a Ukrainian dictionary. If you think about Ukrainian national heroes, Taras Shevchenko, the great, you know, Ukraine Shakespeare, um, he was imprisoned by by the Tsarist regime. I mean, I mean, he he wrote some stuff in Russian, you know, diaries in Russian, but basically he wrote in Ukrainian. He more or less invented Ukrainian as a literary language, and. Um, we, you know, we, 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 if we go, if you go forward to the 1920s and 1930s, the Ukrainians talk about a generation of poets and intellectuals and writers. They have a name for it. It's called the Executed Renaissance. The Executed Renaissance. The, these were the best, most creative people in Ukrainian society, and they were shot by Stalin. And one other thing, um, which was that spring of this year, I was at the London Book Fair, uh, which had a kind of Ukraine theme, and I was sitting with uh, a Ukrainian writer called Victoria Amelina, and she just had her first novel translated into English. I met her literary agent. I gave her a copy of my book, Invasion. We, we chatted. We hugged. Um, four months later, the Russians killed her. She was in Kramatorsk, in the east of the country, having a pizza with two writers from South America, and uh, an Iskandar missile wiped out the, the, the restaurant, and she died. Uh, and there are lots of events going on to commemorate her. I was just at the book festival in, in Lviv, the Lviv book festival, where, where her friends were, were talking about her. And what, 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 what is happening in Ukraine, unfortunately, is another executed renaissance. The, the best people are, are fighting, are dying, the most involved, the most creative, sometimes poets, sometimes uh, uh, novelists, and it, it, it is a tragedy. Ukraine is fighting for its existence. And, and you know, my, my message t today, really, to, in Helsinki is that we have to support them and support their struggle for, for, for freedom. Well, Finland is still doing that. Uh, in this book also you mention uh, our president Sauli Niinistö because uh, well uh, he was among the well I mean of course we in Finland were following him very carefully but but um, this is something you just discussed with Kalle Knivila, Finnish Swedish writer on stage uh, two hours ago that uh, Putin has tried everything in order to keep Finland out of NATO. And then he invades Ukraine and uh, it will be like minutes and Finland is in the NATO. Yeah, I, I, I mean, basically, <clears> that there's a big irony here about Vladimir Putin. V Vladimir Putin genuinely thinks that he is the greatest spy of, of the, the post-war era. He thinks he's a brilliant intelligence operative. He um, does not trust anyone else. He thinks he has unique capabilities, unique abilities. And, and yet he got everything wrong in, in the last few years. He thought that Ukrainians were, were, were basically Russians and their leaders were Nazis, in inverted commas, and Russian army would come in and everybody would cheer the Russian army. He genuinely thought that. He thought the West, Finland, other European countries would be um, very unhappy about taking over Crimea, but would do nothing, ultimately, beyond sanctions and a few words of indignation. Um, and what, what did he get? He, he got um, an incredible fight back, which I write about in Invasion from the Ukrainian people. He got... NATO kind of re rejuvenated with, with Sweden and Finland joining. He got the West 
remembering what, why it existed. And, and basically, the, the, the choice is pretty clear. The choice has never been clearer in Europe. Either we have nihilism and we have big countries smashing up smaller countries and changing the map through invasion and force, or we have democracy, we have European values, we have self-determination, we have freedom, we have the right to a decent life where no one's trying to kill you or bomb your house. Uh, and it's very black and white. It's, it's good versus evil. Um, we have to understand that, actually, that, that it, you know, this is not, it's not fascism from the 1930s with Hitler and you know, Stalin and so on. It's fascism now. And it's, it's our generation that has to find answers to this problem. Um, let's go to the first weeks of the invasion. Uh, in your book, there is uh, sort of, uh, I mean, no, there's nothing funny about the war, but I'm still saying that there is some hilarious detail um, when, um, well, how do we know that the Russians, uh, the Russian army, and especially army generals were thinking that they will just uh, go to Ukraine and, and the country will surrender. Actually, there was something really hilarious found in the luggage. They left everything behind. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean my, my book begins with uh, February the 24th um, in Kiev. I was, I was there when the invasion started and these tank columns were coming from, from Belarus, through Chernobyl, through these pine forests. Uh, and swamps and, and lakes. It's, it's a very green landscape. Um, and of course, what, what happened, which they were not expecting, was the Ukrainians fought back. But it wasn't just the Ukrainian army fought back. I mean, I, I, I was there um, in spring talking to villagers. And what they would do is the, these imperial columns of tanks and attack helicopters would go past. And the Ukrainians would watch. And they would go around the back and they would make a phone call and they would call in the coordinates to the Ukrainian army who would then attack the column with artillery. And, and this was the problem, the assumption, Putin's assumption was he was just fighting the army and a few people in government. In fact, he's fighting an entire country. Mm. Uh, they all hate him. They all want to kick the Russians out. And, and the reason we know that the plan was to take Kiev was they found in, 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 in some of the armored vehicles, they found parade uniforms. So, so they were going to take Kiev, they were going to put their smart uniforms on, they were going to raise the Russian flag above Freedom Square in, in uh, Kiev, they were going to install their own pro-Russian government, which was waiting, uh, and they would have a victory parade. And what's so crazy is, um, I mean, it, it, it's like cosplay. It's as if they were reenacting the Second World War in their heads but they'd not reckoned on the Ukrainians fighting back. This is so important. Let me explain this in Finnish. Tämä on niin tärkeä pointti, että mä sanon tämän nyt suomeksi ja esittelen vielä kirjailijan. Luke Harding on siis The Guardianin toimittaja, kirjoittanut monta kirjaa. Juttu on se, että kun tämä armeija hyökkää, Venäjän armeija Kiovaan silloin, tämä viimeinen osa invasiota, siis sodasta, joka on alkanut kauan sitten, niin nämä lähtee äh, pakoon, tulitusta, koska siis Ukraina puolustautuu, ja mistä me tiedämme sen, että he aikoivat todella tulla Kiovaan. Näistä kenraalien matka- tai niin kuin korkean sodanjohdon matkalaukuista löytyi siis paraati, univormut ja sitten jonkinlaiset paperit, jossa oli selitetty vielä, miten se paraati tehdään, eli kuka marssii missäkin kohtaa riviä. Ja uh, was it like uh, they were going to have the parade in three weeks or something? What what was the time? You I, I, mentioned something. Yeah, I, I mean, basically, yeah. P Putin believed that Kiev would fall in three or four days. But but actually, to be fair, I was in Kiev, and a lot of people in Kiev thought Kiev would fall in three or four days. Uh, and one of the, the key chapters of my book is about President Zelensky, mm. uh, and that the Russians were certain he would run away to to America. And, and go and hide in New York or Harvard or Stanford. Um, and I really think the turning point in, in the invasion was three days, three, day three, when um, uh, Zelensky appears um, outside and he holds an iPhone. Um, and by the way, no, no, no politician on the planet is better at using iPhone than Zelensky. I mean, he really is a genius. He could teach everybody else how to do it without looking like a fool. 
Uh, and he just says in Ukrainian, he says, Ya tut, Ya tut, I'm here, I'm here. And what, what was so brave about that was, you know, I was in Kiev at the time, and it, the, the, the Russians were not going to sit down and have tea with him. They wanted to kill him. Mm. That the, I was told there was a plan to drop paratroopers into Kiev uh, and secure all government buildings. They would have shot him in the head. Uh, and the, the plan nearly worked. The plan was to take Gostomol airfield, which they tried to do, and then to bring in lots of VDV, as they're called. Um, and the Ukrainians managed to stop them, and, and the, the, the advance was halted 15 kilometers outside Kiev. I mean, they came very close. You can drive from the presidential administration to where the Russians were in about 20 minutes. Mm. Oh. We have to talk a couple of words about Zelensky, but this is something which is really, really sort of uh, gives me goosebumps in, in this book. Tämä on siis todella tulee kylmät väreet siinä kohtaa, kun lukee tätä luken kirjaa, jossa tosiaan presidentti Zelenski antaa haastattelua ja sanoo siis olen täällä ja tut. Eli minä, se tarkoittaa siis sitä, että hän ei ole painut ulkomaille. Uh, he also said that I don't want a flight ticket, I want weaponry and uh, that's he, he has been giving these quite legendary one-liners. Uh, but Putin must be rageous because uh, it, it must be awful for him because he has tried to kill tigers with his bare hands without wearing a shirt, riding a horse and uh, flying with uh, birds uh, and everything. And then there's this guy, uh, ex-comedian, in Ukraine, who has become like the symbol of freedom and sex symbol and uh, everything. I mean, Putin has tried everything. And for Zelensky, it takes like... Uh, some, I, mean, I mean, he's, he's just uh, failing everywhere, except for... Well, well uh, except he doesn't think here. he's failing. He yeah. thinks he's winning. Uh, and he thinks he will win. He can win. Uh, and what he's relying upon is for... European countries to lose interest in the war, to be replaced, as just happened in Slovakia, by right-wing populist leaders. I mean, Slovakia today stopped, I mean, it's a small country, today stopped sending weapons to, to Ukraine. And also, he's betting big on someone called Donald Trump. He, he is waiting, praying for Donald Trump to come back as US president. Yeah in uh, January 2025, because he understands that if Trump comes back, that's, God, that's God, also God, in God, yeah, I read, I read yeah. about Donald Trump in Russia. Oh, yeah. if, if Trump comes back, then, then all uh, assistance from America to um, Ukraine will stop. Uh, and also, you, you heard it here first, if Trump comes back, I think that America will probably leave NATO. So Finland joins as America exits. Um, but, 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 all I can say is my latest conversations with people in Washington, for now, they think he will be the nominee for the Republican Party. They don't think he can win. Let, let's just hope they're right. Um, because it would be a, a nightmare for, for everybody, for Europe, but it would be a disaster for the Ukrainians. And, and this is Putin's game plan, is to go long. Long war, grind everybody down, destroy everything, uh, and, and to win in the end. Yeah, war costs money, lives, everything. Uh, one thing about the Slovakia, uh, the, the elections were probably uh, somehow manufactured. I mean, uh, according to the latest news, that uh, Russia might have interfered a lot in the elections. In Finland, we are talking about that a lot, that Russia might interfere our presidential elections. And, and this is one thing where Finns are incredibly naive when they are reading like uh, the chat um, pages of, of uh, our biggest newspapers and, and um, television like Wiley, Yle, Sivut or Helsingin Sanomat or others. Uh, the guy who is saying that Ukraine is full of Nazis uh, is maybe there like Jarmo from Tampere. But originally, that's Igor from yeah, St. Petersburg. Yeah, it, it's I Igor or Sergei yeah. from Petersburg. I, I mean, I, I, I can just tell you from my yeah. personal experience that I, I've had... Uh, I, I mean, my experience in Finland is always delightful. It's always a pleasure to be here. But, but I've, I've had about 15 years of uh, a, a, a online abuse from Russian trolls. Um, and they say I am a Russophobe, that I am a spy, that I work for NATO. 
I, I don't I don't know what the, the quite what the fancy is, but what, what's interesting is that they got a bit better. So t ten, ten years ago, they wrote in very bad English, uh, and, and they were Sergey from St. Petersburg, and 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 now they are they are Jane from London. Their English has improved. They have better talking points. Their profile looks more real. I mean, they're kind of professionalized. Yeah. But, but also, I don't think we should be carried away by Russian propaganda. Yeah, there's Russian propaganda. There's an attempt to influence what we read and how we think. But quite often, it's, it's clumsy and dumb and a bit stupid. And I, I think we should be aware about it, but we shouldn't. I, I, I don't think Russia will is able to influence the outcome of the Finnish presidential election. I really don't. I, I hope so too. No, I don't. I don't think they will actually haggle so much that they will make us to choose a president we would not choose. What they are just doing is that they make people quarrel. To uh, well, I mean, they they just make yeah, that, that, uh, us that, 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 angrier yeah, that, towards that, each other. That's yeah, what they do. That, that's but absolutely right. I mean, the method is not to. I mean, Putin is not some great magician or genius. Yeah. What what his his spy services are good at is finding uh, problems, social issues, culture war um, issues, which divide Western societies, and to exploit that. Mm. Uh, so so he's like. There's like a little fire burning, right, mm. in your garden. And he is the, the arsonist who comes by and pours paraffin so the flame, flames are bigger. And, and yes, we all shout at each other. The yeah. more we shout at each other, the, the better. Exactly. For him. I, yeah. <laughs> I explained this in Finnish so that nobody yeah, yeah. thinks that Voima is saying they will choose our yeah, president. Yeah. Joo, eli Voiman toimittaja Simes ei tässä nyt sano, että Venäjä valitsee Suomen presidentin uh, sekaantumalla vaaleihin. Mutta mä sanon, että varmasti sekaantuu vaaleihin. Ja ei se tavoite ole välttämättä, että uh, koko tulos kääntyy, vaan... Halutaan saada ihmiset riitelemään keskenään. Sen takia mä aina varoitan noista keskusteluboteista, että ne puhuu suomea, ne on aina suomalaisen nimisiä ja ne on kotosin aina Tampereelta tai jostain. Ne ei ole koskaan Pietarista eikä Moskovasta eikä Tomskista tai Omskista, vaan ne on, ne on todella niin kuin hyvin, hyvin meikäläisten oloisia. Uh, one last thing, uh, you are maybe going back to... Ukraine again because that's your major job but anyway you have to write more because then we well then you will be back here and we go I, I, to sauna I've, I've again I've written quite and a lot already I mean I mean it, it, yeah, no. yeah yeah but every time you have a new book you are invited here and we go to sauna we went sauna yesterday yeah so okay what are you writing next um, Besides uh, the Guardian, I I, the, uh, I, 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 um, uh, I I have an idea for a book, but but it's not it's not possible at the moment. It's not possible because I was kicked out of Russia in 2011. That the Russian Foreign Ministry mm. published a list uh, last summer of about 30 writers and intellectuals who were, who were banned for life from the Russian Federation. I I was number 24. I don't know why I was number one, but I was number 24. Okay, I'll take 24. Um, um, but, but my idea... So you were downgraded. I, I, well, I don't know. I was, there'd been, I was on the first list. There have been five lists now. But anyway, th that's not my point. My, my point is that the book I would like to write, I have a title. It's called Downfall. And it's about the end of the Russian Empire and the end of Vladimir Putin. Uh, unfortunately, it hasn't happened yet, and I can't go to Moscow to report. But I have a fantasy that, that when it happens, I will, I will write a book called Downfall. And the thing I really want to do, may, maybe as an old man on, on one of those little wheeling frames, uh -huh. is I want to go to the, the KGB and knock on the door and go to the archive and find their, you know, their file on me and find out who was, who was informing on me, who was, who was talking to them... You know, I had four years in Moscow. I met a lot of people, um, and I would like to write a book about that. And and also the kind of w what is it that makes some humans resist tyranny and some humans embrace tyranny? W what is it about our psychology that some people are, are 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 brave and some people are cowardly? And how how do they, how do you justify that to yourself? You know, you love your children, and yet yet. By day, your behavior is, you're, you're a kind of fascist. I think that's totally fascinating. That, that's the book I'd like to write, but I, I can't write it yet. Oh. oh, well, we are so looking forward to that. And when waiting for that, we can still read you, well, in English, 
uh, I'd never trust these translators. But anyway, we can, <laughs> we can translate, read the translation Guardian. Translation is good. These we can translate, yeah. but I mean we can read the Guardian. Okay. <laughs> sure. Thank you so much, Luke Harding. Thank you.